Homecoming by Cynthia Voigt, Part 2, Chapter 7 Late one morning, as Dicey stood in the blazing sunlight, where the tent had been the night before, coiling up the long ropes so that Samson could stack them evenly on the truck and find them when he needed to stake down the sides of the tent that evening in Berlin, James and Maybeth and Sammy approached her. Hey, James said. I don't need any help, Dicey told him. Go on and do what you like. Are we going to go to Chrisfield? James asked. We're all ready. We packed our things into a paper bag and your map too. Will says he can take us now in Claire's car. Is it time? Darcy asked. Will says so, James said. Let me just finish this, OK? More goodbyes, Darcy thought to herself, coiling up the last rope into a dark brown hoop, piling loop upon loop. I'm, on, I'm unfond of goodbyes, she said to herself. All of their goodbyes lay like the coiled ropes on the ground, connected and unconnected, curling silently, finished things. But the kids were right, and Will was right, it was time. Dicey took a deep breath, time to get moving. She sat beside Will in the front seat, James and the little kid sat beside it, behind him. Dicey took out her map, time to put the circus behind them. The circus people stood around and waved and made jokes. Dicey looked around at them, gathering together there in the fairground, their hands held high, their friendly wishes for good luck floating around the car still, like cherry blossoms blowing down to the ground. The car pulled out of the fairgrounds. Goodbye, everybody called. Goodbye, goodbye. After a while, Dicey turned to the map. There was nothing to look at on the road. It was just like Route 1. What route are we on? she asked Will. Thirteen. We follow that to just south of a place called Princess Anne. Then we get on to 313, Will said. How do you figure to find her? Look up the address in a phone book, Dicey answered. Then we'll ask directions. We've got lots of time, Will assured her. All I have to do is go back, pick up Claire and the Beast and the trailer and make it to Berlin in time for supper. Are you going to take us right there? Dicey asked. He didn't turn his head. His profile was smooth lines, slightly curved, except where his nose jutted out and his beard jutted out at the end of his chin. His skin was smooth and brown like silk. He didn't answer, he just nodded. But why? Dicey asked. To make sure you're OK, he said. Dicey looked out the window. City clutter had fallen behind, and now there was country clutter. Junkyard, the trailer park, <clears throat> billboards advertising dog food and faraway hotels. Beyond these, the land stretched away to low, flat country. The fields and woods all had shallow ditches dug around them to drain away water. Most of the land was being used for farms, interspersed with patches of lob lollies and other trees. Chrisfield's a small town, Dicey said to Will. We'll be OK. You don't want me to take you right there, do you? Dicey leaned towards him. It's not that. It's she doesn't know about us. Not only that we're coming, but she doesn't even know we exist. We didn't know about her until our cousin in Bridgeport told us we had a grandmother. And I don't know how she'll be. There was this priest in Bridgeport. He had somebody here come to see her and tell her. She wouldn't let him in or listen. He said she screamed so she couldn't hear what he was saying. So I don't know how she'll act. Mama... Her voice faded away. There's a lot you haven't told me, told me, isn't there? Will asked. Yes, Dicey thought. It gets so complicated. I'll tell you what, Will said. How do you want to do it? I'll go along with you if you'll make me one promise. You keep your promises? Yes. If you'll promise me that you'll come to me if you need help. We'll be in Berlin for a week, four shows, and then three days off on the beaches. The police can always find me if you call. Will you promise? Dicey thought about that, but what could you do? Who knows? What do friends do for each other? Something, whatever. Will you promise? OK, Dicey said. I promise. We'll be coming by again in eight months, but anything can happen in eight months. I can't just dump, dump you kids off, not and forget about you. I can't do that. But I can let you do it your own way if I know you'll call me if you need to, if it's not working out.
you're a little bit of my life now, you can't get away and I can't get, get rid of that, that's a fact. Dicey understood. A lot of people had little bits of her life now and they were tied to her now or she was tied to them. To some of them she owed something that she hadn't paid yet, like Wendy and Stuart or Cousin Eunice. You didn't just let people go, that's what Will meant. You always did what you could. Dicey leaned back into her own corner by the door. Well, what I thought was, she said, we'd go downtown and find out where she lives, then just go out there. That was almost the truth. And you want me to leave you off and drive away, Will said. Dicey had no idea what he was thinking. Are you scared, he asked her. Some. Why? It's a last chance for us, Dicey said. Oh, I don't know about that, Will said slowly. You could say all of life is a series of last chances. OK, Dicey said, but inside of houses, no matter what they look like from the outside, even that one, the car sped past a tall brick house, surrounded by old elm trees and seeming serene and wise, as if it had stood there for so many years that nothing could surprise or hurt it. You can't tell what's inside. You can't tell what might happen. How do you know who to trust when you meet people? How can I tell about this grandmother? I know I can always run, but when there are four of us... Wouldn't it be easier if I stuck with you, Will asked. Dicey shook her head. Well, yes, of course it would, but I have to know by myself for us. OK, Will said, OK, you can have it your way. <clears throat> As they neared Crisfield, entered the town limits, followed the main street, they all fell silent. Dicey could almost hear the worries that nobody said aloud. The air inside the car grew thick with them. The road ran straight and broad until it came to the water. They looked around. Docks, most of them vacant now on this summer morning, stretched out into the bay. Sheds lined the land's edge. Piles of small wire boxes were everywhere, and oyster shells had been scattered like a layer of earth. A few people, mostly old men, sat in the sunlight looking at nothing. Well, Dicey said, we'll meet again, we'll turn to her, one way or another, OK? OK, Sammy said. The Tillemans climbed out of the car. They stood at the road's end by the water's edge. Will backed the car, turned it around, looked out the window to give them the sums up signal and drove away. Until the station wagon was out of sight, the Tillemans didn't move. Dicey held the grocery bag in one hand and the other hand she held up in farewell and she could no, until she could no longer see the square back of the car. They were on their own again. OK, Dicey said. She passed the bag to James. You wait here. I'm going to find a phone book. She didn't wait for anything, not even to study the flat expanse of blue water. She walked back along the docks to the sidewalk and entered a grocery store. There were, was a poster in its window advertising Will's Circus. The store was filled with darkness, dust and the smell of the food on its shelves. Dicey stood inside the screen door for a minute while her eyes adjusted to the dim light. The only person in the store was a woman in a stained apron behind a glass-framed counter. Dicey walked up to her. The woman had thick, strong arms and her hands were mottled red. Her face was pale and thick with flesh. Her eyebrows were straight and bushy over little colourless eyes. Yeah, she asked, leaning her elbows on the top of the counter. What can I get you? Her words came thick and slow, like molasses. Again, something like Mama. I'm looking for a phone book, Dicey said. Do you have one I can look at? The woman nodded. She plodded out from behind the meat counter and walked heavily down to the cash register at the front of the store. She pulled out a thin phone book from underneath the counter there. She watched Dicey open it. There was a Peter Tilleman on a place called Deal Island and a G. Ridgely Tilleman in Princess Anne. There was no Abigail Tilleman. There was no A. Tilleman either. Maybe their grandmother didn't have a phone or maybe it was listed under their grandfather's name. Only there was no Tilleman listed for Chrisfield. Dicey looked at the page and chewed on her lip. None of the Tillemans listed lived in Chrisfield. Was her grandmother still here? Yes, because that priest had gone to see her. He would have told Father Joseph if she'd moved or died. He knew where she lived. 
Something wrong? the woman asked. I've got work to do, the woman continued to prod Darcy. She leaned down on the counter as if she needed the rest. I was looking for the tele telephone number for Abigail Tillerman, Dicey said. Why would you do that? I was going to call her up, see if she needed some help around the place, Dicey said. I've never seen you before, the woman remarked. We're new, Dicey said. We just moved in. Ab won't hire you, the woman said. She's letting the farm go. Selling it? Dicey asked. No, she'd never sell the place, but she can't work it by herself. That's why I thought she might hire me, Dicey said. The woman shook her head, closed up the phone book and put it away. Besides, she hasn't had a phone since Bullet died. If you'd asked me, I'd have told you. She came down and threw her phone through the telephone company window. You don't want to work for her. The woman trudged back down the aisle to the meat counter. Dicey stood where she was, listening to the hum of a large refrigerator. Where is her farm anyway? She called to the back of the store. <clears throat> Down to the water, south, the woman answered. What road? Landing Neck. It goes off South Main, half a mile inland, maybe a mile. There's a bend on Landing Neck and a new little house sits right on it. Next mailbox is Ab's, but it's seven miles. I wouldn't go out there, she's queer. Queer? Crazy as a coot, that's my opinion. We leave her alone, you should too. Maybe you're right, Dicey said. No maybes about it. Dicey left the store. She returned to her family. Their eyes held the same question. Dicey sat on the edge of the dock, hanging her feet over the water. James, Maybeth and Sammy sat in a line beside her. You couldn't see the bottom of the water. It was muddy, so you could only see a little way down into it. The waves gurgled beneath them. More bad news, Dicey thought to herself, but why didn't she feel bad? She looked around at the docks and the dozing men and the water and the shacks. She picked up an oyster shell and dropped it into the water. The air smelled of salt and fish and motor oil. You know what this is like? Dicey asked James. It's like Provincetown, isn't it? It smells like it. Yeah, but what about our grandmother? She lives seven miles out of town on Landing Neck Road. She doesn't have a telephone. How do we get there? I don't know yet, but I thought, James, I want to go out there alone, just in case. I want you to stay here with the kids, and I'll come back for you when I know. Know what? If it's okay for us there. I don't like that, Dicey. What if you get in trouble? Better just me than all of us, right? Will said we could call the Berlin police to get him if we need help, so if I don't come back, then you can call him. Here's the money for lunch and anything. Can you keep an eye on Maybeth and Sammy? Yeah, but I don't like it. I'm in charge, James, remember? OK, but... Dicey gave him the money she had left, nine dollars. She leaned over to talk to Maybeth and Sammy. You, watch, you do what James says, you hear? They both nodded. That's all right then, Dicey said. She stood up quickly and hurried away without looking back. The business section of Crisfield lay next to the water, low buildings with big plate glass windows. The business section, crowded as close as it could to the bay, looked out over the docks as if that was where its real interest lay. Beyond that, residential streets branched out, circling around the town itself. There seemed to be three kinds of houses. There were lots of churches, even on the one street Dicey followed out of town. There were mostly small stucco or clapboard buildings with short steeples, <clears throat> and there were the usual narrow clapboard houses on little handkerchief lawns, two storeys high, two rooms wide. The third kind were large wooden houses with broad porches that ran around the buildings. They had odd shapes, round towers, octagonal bays, balconies. These houses had paint that had faded and peeled. Often their screens were ripped or doors hung askew, but they spoke clearly of what had once been. Once they'd been homes for large rich families, once the spiralled pillows, pillars that held up the veranda roofs had gleamed with white paint. Once the tall windows of the ground floors had opened into rooms crammed with plush furniture and oriental rugs, and the large trees in the yard swarmed with climbing children. 
These were the kinds of houses that might have treasures in the attic or ghosts in the cellar. These were the kinds of houses that could burst with life. Now they rotted quietly, neglected, sad, but filled with mysterious memories. And Icy walked on, walking fast. She turned at the second stop sign and found herself on Landing Neck Road in farm country, where broad fields burgeoned with corn or barbed wire contained cows and horses, where chickens and ducks wandered around the yards. The farmhouses sat next to the road, quiet and clean, secretive. <clears throat> How would she know if their grandmother's house was safe for them? What questions did you ask a person to find out if you could like one another, if she could be trusted? <clears throat> Dicey sneakers made no noise on the roadway. No cars overtook her. There was no sound at all, except the occasional distant barking of a dog or lowing of a cow. The silence wrapped around her like a quilt, a silence made up of trees growing and corn ripening, of the bright sky glowing and the distant water following its tides. This was not an empty silence. Six miles outside of town, <clears throat> Dicey came to the expected bend in the road. <clears throat> a low, one-storey white house looked out from a stand of pines. Behind it were stables. Two pastures, where long-legged horses grazed, came next. Half a mile down the road, Dicey saw the mailbox, dented, rusted, its post awry. <clears throat> Ilerma was all that remained of sloppily painted black letters. The little door hung open like a dog's straw tongue, Two or three old leaves lay inside and a plastic glass with a straw sticking out of its cover. Across the road, where the farm itself laid, lay, overgrown fields stretched back to meet a thick wood of pine trees, oaks and tall, top-heavy loblollies. The fields had small trees scattered over them, pine and maple saplings, and the grass was thick and tangled, as tall as Dicey's waist. The driveway ran straight, straight between the fields, it too was overgrown. You could barely make up the ruts where car wheels would fit. The sun had risen high into the sky. Dicey turned into the driveway, walking slowly now, even reluctantly. She did not look ahead, but at the ground before her feet. Abandoned, that was the word this farm said to her. She couldn't even see the house until she had passed under the pines, walking now on a thick carpet of needles that seemed never to have been disturbed. The air under the pines was thick and shady. The house sat behind a small orchard and beyond it a barn was slowly falling down. The house was faded white clapboard two storeys high and had a screened porch all along the front that ran around the sides. The roof, grey slate, slanted down in four directions from a central peak. Two chimneys stuck up through the roof. The house was silent, vacant, neglected. Long, weedy grass grew up as high as the porch floor. Honeysuckle spread over the screens of the porch and its long fingers reached for the trees in the yard. Most of the trees were short, heavily leaved. Some had tiny apples growing on them. They had the rough bark of fruit trees. <clears throat> One larger tree grew right up at the front of the house, hiding the front door, shading the lawn. This tree looked like an umbrella, held overhead by four trunks that spread out from their common source. Its broad leaves made a green canopy against the sunlight. It wouldn't be a good climbing tree, Dicey thought, walking up to it and past it, but you could make a platform tree house to rest in the four trunks and build steps out of pieces of wood to go up one trunk. And you would have a house like a boat, almost floating on air, and the long leafy branches stretching above like sails. Dicey pushed her way through the long grasses to the steps leading to the porch. The grass tickled her, no her knees. Grasshoppers leaped aside to let her pass. The steps were rotting away. <clears throat> the screen door hung from broken hinges. The sun couldn't penetrate the honeysuckle leaves, so the motionless air on the porch was as dark as twilight. Dicey knocked on the door. It was a wooden door, once painted white. A rusted nail stuck out from its centre over Dicey's head. Nobody answered. She knocked again and listened. She heard faint noises, like some night creature scurrying, but the noises did not come towards the door. Somebody was in there, of that Dicey was sure. She knocked again. Three loud raps. No voice called out. Dicey turned the knob and pushed against the door. It was locked. She went back across the porch and down the steps. She walked around to the side of the house. 
The side looked just like the front, <clears throat> except that it had no steps or door. There were two windows on the second floor and four on the first, which was barely visible through honeysuckle. The honeysuckle here had not grown as fast <clears throat> as that on the front of the house. The porch, she noticed, continued around the back. The whole house was surrounded by a broad porch. All the second story windows had their shades down. Nobody could be seen inside, nor any light. Dicey went on, around to the back. She saw the woman the moment the woman saw her. The woman sat on the bottom of some steps facing out, over more fields, only these had crops growing in them, and the distant dull green of marsh grass. She wore a shapeless blouse over a long, shapeless skirt. Her feet were bare. Her dark eyes looked at Dicey angrily. Her skin was tanned. Her hair had been hacked short, so its iron-grey curls burst helter-skelter all over her narrow head. Dicey stood where she was. She swallowed twice. Her throat was suddenly dry. Mrs Tillerman, she finally asked. Her voice squeaked. You're trespassing, the woman said. She had a thin, stiff voice, not like Mama's at all. I thought I heard when I knocked. I didn't know if... Dicey stepped forward. Fact is, I wonder if you would hire me to work for you. She stood right in front of the woman now, <clears throat> her grandmother. Her grandmother's eyes seemed big for her face as she stared at Dicey. But maybe that was just because her face was small, the skin stretched tight over its bones. Her eyes, now that Dicey was closer, were not brown but dark hazel, browns and greens, without any yellow to give them a sparkle. Fine lines sprayed out from around her eyes. These were the eyes of the girl in Cousin Eunice's photograph album. The rest of her was all different, but the eyes were the same. Fact is, you're trespassing, her grandmother said. Who told you to come here? Nobody. I heard you were alone, so I thought I'd try. I don't know you, do I? Dicey shook her head. We're new here. Why aren't you in school? It's summer. Not for long. Her grandmother stood up. She walked up the steps and through the screen door without looking back. The back door stood open and she went straight into a kitchen. Dicey followed her. Her grandmother opened a glass-fronted cupboard and pulled down a can of spaghetti. She took a can opener out of the drawer and she opened the can. A saucepan waited on the stove. She opened another drawer, took out a big spoon and scooped the stiff red and yellow contents of the can into the saucepan. With a match, she lit a fire under the burner. <clears throat> she dropped the match into an ashtray and turned to take a bowl from the cupboard. Dicey might just as well not have been there. Her grandmother waited by the stove, stirring in the pan. I didn't say come in, she said. You never said if you want me to work, Dicey answered. Hazel eyes studied Dicey. Dicey studied the, bare, studied the barefooted woman. Her feet were caked with earthy dirt. How do I know you're going to rob me, her grandmother said. How could she know, Dicey thought. The people in the houses were in just as much danger as the people outside of them. I'm not, Dicey said. Doesn't look like you've got much to steal anyway. <clears throat> you have family? Yes, Dicey said. Where do you live? In town. I can work hard. Your barn needs painting and the screens and the steps and the lawn. I could take off the honeysuckle. I'm not too old to do that. <clears throat> I can pick and weed. So can I. So can anybody. You better get down to bowl since you've invited yourself to lunch. Dicey did as she was told. They sat down at a long table, big enough for ten people. It was made of wood and had been scrubbed to a pale, smooth finish. Dicey sat across from her grandmother. She spooned the canned spaghetti into her mouth. After the first bite, she ate quickly, trying to fill up her stomach without tasting anything. You like my spaghetti? her grandmother asked. No, Dicey said, but I'm hungry. Do you like it? It's easy to fix. You know what I sometimes think? Her grandmother looked straight at her, her mouth chewing. I sometimes think people might be good to eat. Cows and chickens eat corn and grass and turned into good meat. People eat cows and chickens. In people it might turn into something even better. Do you even think of that? Dicey shook her head. Especially babies, her grandmother said. She swallowed thoughtfully. Or children, do you have brothers and sisters? Yes. Who told you I was alone? A lady in the grocery store. Millie, she's the butcher. Can you imagine that, a lady butcher? Why not, Dicey asked. I guess you might say so. Millie is one and that's a fact. Facts are facts. What did she say about me? 
Nothing much. Did she tell you I was crazy? Her grandmother wasn't looking at her. Dicey didn't answer. Maybe I am, you know. When you die, all the gases build up in your body for weeks, like yeast in dough. And you swell and swell, then things start exploding. That's where the stink comes from, and after that you're as fresh as a daisy and the worms and maggots have you. What do you think? Dicey put a spoon down. She was through eating. Her grandmother's mouth twisted. What do you think about death? Don't be smart with me, girl. Dicey was puzzled. Or don't you think? <clears throat> I saw a tombstone. Home is the hunter, home from the hill, and the sailor home from the sea. That was what it said. As if, Dicey tried to explain her thoughts, that was the quiet place at the end of things. It's not quiet, her grandmother said, not for the worms. I wouldn't care about that if I was dead, Dicey said. Maybe I am crazy, her grandmother said, you know. Dicey was beginning to think she might be. Maybe not. Do you feel sorry for me? Why should I? Dicey asked. Old, alone, crazy, the farm falling down around me. My husband died these four years and more. I'm sorry, Dicey said. I'm not. I'm happy since he died. Why? Dicey asked. He kept wanting his shoes polished. He never did polish them himself. First thing I did, I put myself a washing machine. Do you play the piano? No. Too bad, the woman said. I've got one. Haven't played it myself. I never had time. My children did. They all died too, and that was, that was a relief. Dicey stood up. She didn't even feel bad. She didn't feel anything, except maybe glad she had come out here by herself. You're going, her grandmother said. Dicey nodded. You didn't offer to help with the dishes. No, don't bother. I know what children are like. OK, Dicey said. It didn't matter. She'd go back and get her family and they'd call Will. Don't you want to know if I want you to work for me? Her grandmother said. She was still sitting in her chair, but she had turned around to watch Dicey leave. Well, I don't. I couldn't pay you anyway. Dicey nodded and turned her back to the room. The woman's voice spoke from behind her. I know who you are, you hear me? I know who you are and you can't stay here.